So this is now um, a little presentation of my uh, chapter article in the current issue. Um, it's Gaudama's Truth and Method Revisited because I made an original contribution to one of the dialogue papers in which our brief there was to show how the thinking of a significant theorist applies in conflict resolution. Um, my focus was naturally on Gaudama's great book, Truth and Method, Wahrheit und Methode, which came out in 1960, translated in the 70s, and has a tr had a tremendous influence, still does, on conflict resolution and dialogue. He began as a hermeneuticist, an interpreter of cultural texts, both written texts and other objects. He, his great book is a struggle with the idea of interpreting things. Paul talks about otherness. Um, he wasn't talking about destructive otherness. He was talking about otherness from other places and other cultures. And as I've said earlier, it's very hard to summarize the complexity of his thought. But his hermeneutics was that in doing this, you have to come up against your own prejudice, your own fortile. It's actually a good thing to have prejudice and realize it. He, he was critical of the prejudice against prejudice of the scientific method. Um, and he said in this, his great move was to say that interpreting an object was like a conversation with somebody else. So it's a fusion of horizons I mentioned earlier on. This was then taken in conflict resolution the other way around, that hermeneutic dialogue in conflict situations is a dialogue between hermeneuticists where each of them is aware or becomes aware of their own where they don't understand. Mm. Through that, engages in a perpetual process with another horizon, and you move into a third horizon. And I'm going to repeat what I said earlier. This is a very si simple, but why not, encapsulation of his thinking and its influence. It's not that you impose your values on the other. It is not that you empathize with the other and actually take on the other's views. In this consistent engagement, which is a fusion of horizons, you are co-creating something else which has not existed before. That is, now this was seen as a very inspiring idea where it's active dialogue you, and you have to change yourself. And also, he has tremendous passages about language which would um, gladden the heart of the society because it's about how we are created by language. This is, dialogue is fundamental to our human experience, to our own, etc. So that's his great book. Now we are look, engaged here in critical um, dialogue studies and I'm going to hand you out, so let's send them both ways. Paul, thank you, that way, and then round. Um, so I'm going to keep one myself. Thanks, Mike. I'm going to start talking before you've got this because of pressure of time. <laughs> what I've done here, um, in my, uh, just one sentence, in my paper, the first part of it reviews what was in my previous paper, mm -hmm. so that a reader who hasn't read the previous one, you know, what was Gardama on about. Yeah. <laughs> the second section of my paper is what I'm going to illustrate here, which is where are the areas where it doesn't yet work? Mm -hmm. And I give a number of examples. Here is one example. In the third part of my paper, which I'm going to say nothing about, I revisit truth and method and see if I can trace back the reason it doesn't work back into that text. And I think if you do that, you find that Gaudama himself was struggling with the very concept of a horizon and the very concept of a fusion of horizons. And in the last part of my paper, I briefly suggest, which I think is the normative purpose of critical dialogue studies, what comes out of it? What can you do when so far hermeneutic dialogue doesn't work, but you want it to work? What can you do to make it more likely it will work? And I just very briefly touch that on, on at the end here. Now, in this presentation, if we look at this, um, the first little quotation by Answald came in a book that was published in 2002 for 
Gaudama's 100th birthday. He had a good innings, as we would say. And he was born under the Wilhelmine, Germany, and he lived to see 9-11. It's unbelievable when you think of it. And all that time, he was having to adapt to... Anyway, this is, if you just read that, Gardamer's single most important insight may turn out to be a conceptual scheme that allows us to overcome cultural conflicts as well as clashes of different forms of life. Now, the topic here is peace building, so I'll fit that in in a moment. Now, this next bit is Gardamer himself. Actually, those quotations come from the 1990s. His head was slightly turned by his brilliant success, and he was a creature of the 1990s, that very optimistic period. He was saying, my thing says how all the cultures will work together and how marvellous, and you can say it's a bit naive what he says there, even though his philosophy is the opposite. Anyway, th that's Gardamer himself. Now, here's my main example. I'm going to take the um, Canadian philosopher Charles Taylor, uses Gadamer's hermeneutic dialogue to write about how different cultures, deep otherness, whether destructive otherness, I'm going to take an example where it is destructive otherness, can self-overcome. And I would like us, if you don't mind us together, reading the, the, that extract from Charles Taylor. So he says, first of all, what he's doing is the representatives from these different cultures uh, strive to come to an understanding to overcome the obstacles to mutual comprehension and find a language in which both can agree to talk undistortively of each. He says furthermore that in this process, originally distinct horizons, which he calls the different way that each has of understanding the human condition in their non-identity, are seen to meet in mutual self-transcendence. Now, this is his description. For instance, we become aware that there are different ways of believing things, one of which is holding them as a personal opinion. Now, can I ask you, while we're reading this, to think in terms of a conflict that was erupting at exactly the time he wrote this. I think he must have been thinking of this. Mm. And that's 9-11 and Afghanistan. Mm. So, he is, when he says we, he means him, the West. We become aware there are different ways of believing things, one of which is holding them as a personal opinion, which is a Western view. This was all that we allowed for before. Now we have space for other ways and can therefore accommodate the beliefs of a quite different culture. Now, in the context of Afghanistan, it must be we can understand that this other way of doing things is that we're talking about the revelation in Arabic by God via Gabriel to the prophet. That's the other way, not personal opinion. Our horizon is extended to take in this possibility, which was beyond its limit before. Now comes the fusion. But this is better seen as a fusion rather than just an extension of horizons, because at the same time we are introducing a language to talk about their beliefs that represents an extension in relation to their language. Presumably, they had no idea of what we speak of as personal opinions, at least in such areas as religion, for instance. They would have had to see these as rejection, rebellion, and heresy. So the new language used here by them which places opinions alongside other modes of believing as possible alternative ways of holding things true, opens a broader horizon extending beyond both the original ones and, in a sense, combining them mm. in this kind of Aufhebel, kind of Hegelian, new, third, something or other. Now, here comes my critique of this. If you look at that, Taylor's overall framework, which is Gadamerian, which is a fusion of horizons. He says you've got two horizons originally limited coming together. Let's go through it again. We suddenly realise that there's another way of believing things than as personal opinion, namely as the word of God. Now, what is at issue, I know this is a crude simplification in the Afghan war, is that the American-led alliance wanted to as you were, imposed democracy. And the Taliban wanted to impose Sharia. And this was a struggle, ideological, religious struggle. So here, what he is saying is, we, the American coalition, realize that there's another way of holding things true, namely the word of God. Well, the question is, do you imp does that mean we now suddenly say, oh, I see, well, let's have, some, let's have Sharia. If you do, then you really have changed things. If you don't, 
then you haven't changed at all. And the Taliban, when they see this, they're going to say, this is typical subterfuge. They're trying to be subtle, get round, so you don't have... Uh, sorry, yeah. You take the second paragraph. Here he is saying that the Taliban suddenly, oh, my goodness, I hadn't realised there's another way of holding things true, which is as personal opinion. Of course, well, the question is, will the Taliban therefore accept Western democracy? If they do, wow. If they don't, then you haven't at all had a um, extension fusion of horizons. But it's deeper than that, because in this case, it's the actual very idea, mm. Gadamer's idea, of a fusion of horizons, which is challenged by the Taliban. They reject it. So this idea here that you've got opens a broader horizon, extending beyond the both original ones, and in a sense combining them, is part of what's at issue in that conflict. So that's an example of where Gardamer suddenly comes up against something where he so far fails. You can see this by my last quotation there, which is Abu Musab, um, which is the, as it were, the Taliban view. Democracy means sovereignty for man. Islam means sovereignty for the Sharia. In the American form of democracy, any issue is allowed to be put to the vote of the people, and the majority decision prevails upon all. Can we Muslims put an issue that has already been decided for us by Allah up for a vote and accept the will of the majority if they vote against the will of Allah? Of course we cannot. So we can never accept democracy as defined, practiced and promoted by America. So there's your impasse. We turn over um, a little note on Gadama himself, having said what I quoted him saying at the beginning, which is, come on, let's have a general fusion of horizons. When he heard about the attack on the World Trade Center, possibly in his last recorded interview, I think it was, he was extremely despondent. He said, es ist mir recht unheimlich geworden. The world has become quite strange to me. Now, in his own philosophy, this is the beginning of another horizon. He, he's, if it becomes strange, he's come up against the limit of his own philosophy. Now, if he hadn't been 100, but he'd been kind of 10, <laughs> perhaps in his next life, he would have moved on to something, what would it have been? I don't know. It's absolutely fascinating. Now, my final two minutes. Um, of course, this is quite inadequate, but and it's, that's not the only example. I mean, I think Gadamerian hermeneutics can't yet operate in Israel-Palestine. Not yet. And I think it's because, fundamentally, of asymmetry of power, which Mike and Serena pointed out to us. So what, what happens there? Two things. At a theoretical level, when you look back at Gadamer's work, he doesn't take what I call radical disagreement seriously. Mm. He doesn't actually take note of it. And I'm going to suggest a term, whether the society wants to take this up. Mm. I've coined the term agonistic dialogue for that part of radical disagreement in which the conflicting parties directly address each other's utterances. Now, I say that is a form of dialogue, namely the normal form in intense political conflict. In my own field of conflict resolution, um, dialogue, problem solving, etc. They deny it's dialogue. They say this isn't real dialogue. Real dialogue, and then they produce something like hermeneutic dialogue. I say it is real dialogue. It's dialogue when you can't yet do the assumptions of conflict resolution mm. without overstraining this little introduction are that in the two narratives, these are reflexive. They are, as it were, subjective. They are functional. They don't describe truth. They, they, are, they play some other function of need or something. And they are equivalent. Now, that's not what they're saying. The Taliban are not saying that. Palestinians are not saying that. Um, now, what can you do about it? And here's a thing. I think you have to begin, and, and I'm actually echoing something that, was he called Michael who was speaking on mm, that? Say, yeah. I think you have to, when you can't yet do things across, you begin within. And you, the big move you make is you move to collective strategic thinking. Mm. Where are you? Where do you want to go? How do you get there? From that, you have strategic engagement, actually more radical disagreement. Mm. And you bring in third parties. And coming back to A, in my experience, 
if you explore agonistic dialogue at a time of acute, um, intense political conflict, your conclusion isn't that there's a fusion of horizon. It is that the two parties are much further apart than anybody realized. And for me, that's the beginning of wisdom. Mm. If that can be understood, including by the parties, you might open a space for introducing what we all want to introduce, in this case, Gadamerian hermeneutic dialogue. And there are other forms of wonderful dialogue. So that's it. <laughs>